Hi guys, Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now, what would have happened if we'd started engaging young people in the conservation movement much earlier? Would we be seeing more action, more impact and progress within a sector as a result? And how can we address diversity and inclusion issues in a sector that traditionally has been dominated by white men from relatively affluent backgrounds? Now, these are some of the topics we discuss in today's episode with the president of IUCN Canada, James Bartram. Now, James is an inspiring figure within the conservation movement. He describes himself as a change agent, building high functioning teams with real impact, always striving to work himself out of the job. And he believes that youth are the hope of the world and has led teams of over 100 educators, tripling annual budgets from 3 million to 9 million, and taking program participants from 200,000 to half a million people per year. Now, we cover a lot of really fascinating ground in this chat today, and it's one of those episodes where the pre-recording chat was just so fascinating, we just hit record and kept going. So as always, enjoy. We've got a tremendous diversity deficit in our sector. You know, it tends to be, you know, we're, we've created a monoculture. Our, our human resource in the conservation sector, we've created a monoculture just like we created monoculture forests across the West, which are now, you know, susceptible to things like the pine beetle or forest fires anyway. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that, you know, the expertise, the scientists, the biologists, the incredibly hardworking people in our sector historically haven't treated our human talent pool, our human capital with the same kind of sophisticated interpretation of systems as we have biodiversity. That's really fascinating. I've not thought about it like that before, actually. And this idea of the monoculture, I think, yeah, really kind of paints a very clear picture actually as to how conservation has been actually until sort of recent years and the sorts of things you're trying to address yeah i mean we in so we uh, commissioned a survey in canada i think it's the first time it's been done so it, it was you know representative of our population so you know thousands of young people uh, some were high school students uh, some were young adults um, and making sure that we had the regional diversity because it's a tremendously regionalized country um you know gender diversity social economic diversity all the you know all the stats can markers and 70 percent i won't get maybe I might not get the numbers exactly right but about 70 percent maybe a little more um of young people in canada haven't considered an environmental career pathway because they don't know any friends or family that have ever done that job right yeah you know i mean not to beat ourselves up too much but you know historically it's a country club mm-hmm. you know nature conservation is what rich white people do with their spare time mm-hmm. you know um, which is tragic especially in a landscape with deep history you know with the indigenous ways of knowing that do exist on this landscape you know rural remote and indigenous folks have been excluded too much uh, and are you know, an essential kind of asset, human capital asset in our pathway forward, for sure. And what what problem has lack of diversity and inclusion within the Canadian conservation sector kind of caused for the movement, for people, for the environment? What, what well, sort I of... mean, I think there's a couple of approaches. You know, one piece is, you know, constituency. So, you know, that... And, and it is unintentional. If you think like, so national parks, you know, national parks play a pivotal role in nature conservation in Canada. Parks Canada's our state agent for IUCN. You know, they're a critical gateway, hugely, you know, major employer, really important piece of the puzzle. National parks in Canada were created primarily as islands of civilization in a sea of wilderness. And a little over a century later, they're now the only remaining islands of wilderness in a sea of civilization Mm -hmm. in a vast country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that broad base of public support, if you imagine that when national parks were created, 80% or so of Canadians lived rural lifestyles. You know, they lived on the land, they were farmers, they were hunters, they were trappers, whatever their career pathways were. 
you know, they saw natural systems and processes every day in their day-to-day lives. Yeah. Today, 80% of Canadians live in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you and if you imagine our most populous city, Toronto, so 20% of the Canadian population lives in Toronto, and half of Toronto wasn't born in Canada. Wow. You know, okay. so so all these uh, so. So the point is, as a society, we are getting more and more disconnected from natural systems and mm-hmm. processes, and that you know that constituency to support the idea of nature conservation and you know large scale behaviour change and all everything that goes with it. Um, if you've only got twenty percent of the population engaged in nature conservation, it's a pretty tough sell. You yeah. know, if people don't see themselves in the story, if they don't see themselves as part of the solution, if they don't identify with that, that's a challenge. Mm-hmm. And they don't vote certain ways and they make different consumer choices and so on. Um, but, it, you know, in addition to that, it's, you know, it is the human capital. It's the creativity. It's the innovation. You know, I believe firmly, you know, folks like me, <laughs> you know, people with my, you know, history and heritage and skills and attributes we've got a lot to contribute we're really good at systems and processes and you know efficiency and there's certain things that we can contribute but our role at this time is often best served in servant leadership you know so the big step change the reason for hope the optimism that i have is working with young people and you know the next generation of decision makers hopefully will have a lot more you know gender diversity, they'll have a lot more um, indigenous participation, they'll have all these different people who who just understand and interpret the world differently. They see the world differently, they make decisions, you know, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a female, it's going to be an indigenous person, it's going to be the intersection of different ethnic and cultural groups working together. That's how we're going to get that's how we're going to solve these big meaty problems, I think. And I think it's the creativity and innovation that comes from intergenerational and cross-cultural collaboration that's really exciting. Mm. And that leads us really perfectly into the project that you're working on right now, if I can call it that, yeah, which sure. is the Centre of Excellence for Conservation Education that you're kind of working on with the Canadian mm. Wildlife Federation. Uh, could you just give us a bit of an overview now we're kind of into the podcast I think more formally (laughs) (laughs) I just hit record because I think we're having such an interesting conversation I think let's just go if you're happy yeah yeah Uh, what's um what what is this kind of center of excellence for conservation education and how is it seeking to tackle some of these big meaty issues around inclusivity and youth and diversity in conservation yeah so um um as I said, you know, there's a few sort of key players in the Canadian context that have been really championing meaningful youth engagement for certainly the last decade. Mm-hmm. Canadian Wildlife Federation is one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and part of my work uh, in supporting them is really looking at where are the gaps? So where can a national charity make a meaningful contribution? So maybe I'll start by saying what it is it. Uh, so there's no particular desire to compete with universities or colleges, yep. you know. So we do have in Canada good pathways for people who want to um, go through to be biologists or uh, follow policy tracks or those kind of things. So we've got some great universities and some great courses. Yeah. And that's excellent. Um, where we think the, uh, the gap where we think that, you know, kind of Wildlife Federation can really contribute is in those sort of inclusive career pathways. So no academic barriers to entry, um, fairly vocational, skills-based, uh, hopefully employee training. So the intention is that young people would uh, initially engage in um, a 90-day program that would be a full-time program blended online and in, and in person, um, subject to COVID regulations. Um, um, but, uh, and that they would do that in small clusters. So there are probably eight regional clusters across Canada. Yep. Um, and, and really, yeah, like some of those people might be people who perhaps didn't 
graduate high school. Mm-hmm. Maybe they live in a rural part of Canada and they just don't want to move to a big city for several years to take a training program. Maybe they have, you know, grown up on a particular landscape and have an affinity for it. Uh, maybe they have really good um practical skills like travel on the landscape skills um those kind of things Mm -hmm. um and let's get them in a position and expose them to the range of opportunities whether they're you know employment opportunities in government uh some of the family foundations in charity and in the corporate sector there's a huge uh opportunity in the corporate sector uh obviously canada's a rich country with natural resources and some of our natural resource uh companies are doing really great stewardship work Mm -hmm. and so if we can get those young people all working together in a sort of experiential hands-on way hopefully we can give them some foundational skills hopefully we can um, open their eyes a little more to some of the career pathways and sort of blow a little wind in their sails (laughs) Um, but Also, and probably equally importantly, hopefully we can build these kind of cross-sectoral, cross-cultural, and to some extent intergenerational like um, relationships so that they have a network, so they have a support system that as they go forward, they know people from, you know, different sectors, different parts of the country, and that will hopefully help them to be resilient um, and and stay in the environmental environment. sector for their careers Mm, so sort of like building a community and alumni if you like of people that have gone through this training yeah um, but from a different background to the traditional background if you like and opening up new perspectives yeah and and just contribute in ways that are meaningful for them you know so a lot of this is built off the back of Canadian Wildlife Federation and others uh there's been a big investment in Canada particularly in the last five years in volunteerism uh and service learning uh-huh. Um, so there's a couple of big programs. The Canadian Conservation Corps um, is the, is one that the Canadian Wildlife Federation built up. Uh, it's been tremendously successful. It's largely modelled on the set success of some of the American programs, um, particularly the AmeriCorps program. Yep. Um, and so that I would suggest, you know, part of the success of that program is, you know, having making these things available at no cost to the participants and being a vehicle for people who are passionate about nature conservation but maybe never would have met met each other Mm -hmm. you know so it's great when you've got young people on you know perhaps a 10-day outward bound journey having a shared experience you know out in nature and what unites them is their love of nature but they come from a broad range of socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, they might have different first languages um, and just finding that common ground. Yeah. It's been really powerful. Um, And and, and and the truth is it's not rocket science, Mm -hmm. you know, really, you know, there is a deep history of experiential education and it's, you know, it's Kurt Hahn, it's John Dewey and it's Cole. We know how to do this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We just, we just haven't applied it systematically in a disciplined way um in a canadian context to conservation education and what we're talking about here is education that's not in the classroom if i can put it as clearly as i can right we're talking about out out of the classroom out in the countryside um learning skills learning through experience of being out it and being facilitated by teachers and instructors who can who can help you through that process yeah i think so i mean i think there's you know it's always blended i sort of my my sort of most simplest reference when we're talking about this is, you know, you've got to have knowledge, act, activity and reflection. So in every element of the program, you've got to have those pieces. It's got to be multi-sensory, multi-sensory. It's got to be holistic. So, you know, there are ways to do that online. There's ways to do that uh, in person in a more traditional classroom type setting. Um, but at its best, it's going to be, outdoors it's going to be yeah it's going to be in a in a natural context and and there's a few reasons for that you know so the first thing is you really want people to be a little bit out of their comfort zone you don't want them to be traumatized but you want them to be (laughs) in an unusual setting and that really opens them up you know um so 
I mean, tragically, in some ways, for most Canadian youth, being with a, a new group of people out in nature isn't a particularly comfortable place to be mm-hmm. um, or, or a familiar place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you want that. But, you know, there's, I mean, there's good, you know, the, there's good research out there looking at, you know, the physiology of teaching and learning. So um, uh, Ratney's work about the presence of blue light. You know, so we, we now know that if you, want, if you want to enhance cognition and knowledge retention, working outdoors in the presence of blue light is good. Mm. It's more effective. Mm. You know, we know um, that knowledge retention and cognition are enhanced with mild activity. Mm. So if you're walking and talking, you're, that's enhancing uh, the, the learning environment, which again... I mean, again, we, a lot of the a lot of this is is learning from those who've gone before us. So, you know, the apprenticeship models from the you know from the stonemasons going back hundreds of years just work. Practical mentorship, role model in coaching in an outdoor environment. The you know the walkabout model, the sort of indigenous rites of passage that are common in many indigenous cultures. Mm just work you know Mm -hmm. so it's anyway so it's interesting we can learn from that i mean even um i forget there's a great book called the hand i forget who wrote it um i could get you the reference but just the correlation between um manipulation of objects with your hand and knowledge retention so the connection between the brain and the hand is like fascinating and the whole craftsman culture uh anyway all those kind of things are arresting and sort of built in um, to the design of the program. So I would sort of say that the content's important, you know, but the educational design is equally important because you're trying to do two things. You want people to be knowledgeable and, and, and understanding. But in today's society, you know, we have the internet, we have Google. It's not, acquisition of knowledge is a, is a lot easier than it was mm-hmm. even 20 years ago. You know, so it's the attitude, skills, behaviors, and even the individual sort of tenacity, the work ethic, some people call it grit. Um, so it's so it's trying to it's trying to really apply what I would sort of say, you know, world class pedagogy in a in a conservation context. And mm-hmm. Unfortunately, you know, for a, lot of, for a lot of understandable reasons, there aren't a lot of professional, you know, there, there aren't a lot of professional pedagogues in the conservation community globally. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. we're underserved, we're underserved, we're quite light. Uh, and on, by pedagogues, you mean teachers, or can you explain could be, that? Phrase? I mean, it could be teachers, coaches, yeah. educators of all times, but people who understand teaching and learning and really study that you know so you know within the ocn we obviously have the commission on education and communication and that's really strong particularly on marketing and communication yeah and you know in that continuum so if you if you think about the sort of conservation engagement continuum you know on one side you've got the really broad based big numbers light touch activities like a social media campaign Mm -hmm. and on the other side of that continuum you've got deep engagement, you know, year-long, full immersive programs like the ones we're describing. Yep. You know, it's a bit like, you know, from Rio forward, the community decided we haven't got time to invest in youth. The situation is so desperate, Mm. you know, as a community of practice, the environmental sector and the conservation community seem to make a conscious or unconscious decision that we haven't got time to invest in the next generation. We need action now. We need Mm -hmm. to focus on lobbying. We need policy activity. And I'm not passing judgment on that. The the need was urgent, but here we are decades later. We haven't got better. We've got worse. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And had we invested in previous generations, they'd be voting now. Do you think we've lost time? Yeah. Oh, I'm absolutely certain, you know, I'm absolutely certain that 
hindsight being 2020, mm -hmm. you know, had we 25 years ago invested in young people, um, we would be in much better shape than we are today. So looking forwards then, you've really mm -hmm. kind of teed me up my next question perfectly. Looking forwards like, you know, five, 10, let's say 10 years down the line, let's say this prog program gets the funding mm -hmm. and is shaped in the way that you'd like to see it shaped, you know, what, what would be the outcomes for, for the people that have gone through it? You know, what are the job prospects? Um, and how do you see the kind of conservation movement actually starting to benefit from a program like this? And will we see benefits, you know, directly for wildlife and ecosystems and everything else that we want to see, you know, supported more? Yeah, I mean, well, in the you long can say term, twenty years if you want. If, if five or ten is too short, yeah, by the way, no, twenty is fine. Let's go twenty. I mean, well, the I mean, the first thing is our job is to work ourselves out of a job. Yeah. You know, in all social enterprise, you know, we're always looking for the. You know, we need a generation that comes after us that is better than us mm -hmm. and bigger than us. Yeah. And we need it in ten years. Right. You know. So, how do we all work ourselves out of a job? So, it, you know. It should be about servant leadership. Um, so that's the first thing. Mm. Um, we should be able to uh, to validate real species and habitat gains. So we should, within 25 years, be able to attribute, you know, protected areas, species at risk, enhancement, biodiversity, recovery. We should be able to, uh, to attribute those to specific cohorts of, individuals now these cohorts might be really big you know so for example that study i mentioned earlier where we looked at um career aspirations for canadian youth so we're now working on a a, a plan uh, so we're in discussions with sort of five big national partners to repeat that study every year mm -hmm. so it's like okay we've got mm -hmm. some benchmarks we know we're not doing well if we repeat this national survey every year and in parallel to that, several of these organizations like CWF have got, um, you know, interventions, they've got pilot programs, they've got things they're doing. Can we see any correlation? Yeah. Unlikely we can, you know, be specific about whether it's causal or not, but is there any correlation between specific investments in youth and progress, even on that one indicator of mm -hmm interest and aspiration in pursuing an environmental career. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we need longitudinal study. We've got another study um, under the Canadian Committee of IUCN where three of our members are looking specifically at the conservation return and investment of different education programs. So we have a program called Earthingers, which is very focused on younger children. We have one of the uh, Project Wild, which is a teenager's, uh, uh, sorry, Wild Outside, which is a teenager youth leadership program that Canadian Wildlife Federation runs and uh, uh, Project Learning Tree, which is run by the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Mm -hmm. And so these three, in this case, charities in Canada have said, look, we're all spending millions of dollars on education for children. Mm -hmm. about, and we don't really know if we're moving the needle. Mm -hmm. If we're brave enough, to mm -hmm. say, okay, let's let's hire a couple of postdocs. Let's actually create a methodology. Let's figure it out how to evaluate the return on investment of our programs, and sort of put our cards on the table um, and expose the relative merits and strengths for different target audiences. Then we can learn, you know, and then we can learn from each other, and you know, we can all get better. So I think this is, you know, this sort of data-driven approach to conservation is essential. Yeah. Um, and I and I do I also think it's one of the things that's really held back, you know, the professionalization of conservation education. Because too often in our sector, it's seen as the nice to have. It's the sprinkle on the donut. If you've got some spare money at the end of the year maybe you do a nice little course for some people, but it's pretty ad hoc. Bit of outreach. Bit of outreach. And it's probably a tremendously passionate biologist that's kind of cowboying up and doing a bit of education on the side. Yep. You know, and I don't mean to be condescending of 
you know, hardworking conservation biologists who absolutely need to be a piece of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do need to professionalize, you know, and, and the balance between research and education, in my opinion, at least, is, you know, the job of research, whether it's research on educational efficacy or return on investment or research on species at risk recovery or uh, climate mit- mitigation or whatever, Research is the sharp pointy nail of new knowledge or truth. So the research community fashions these sharp pointy nails of truth. The education community creates the the constituency, the sort of educated, equipped and empowered community to drive those nails home. If the folks in the education community are building those constituencies, if they're building a big megaphone and they're, you know, rallying the troops mm-hmm. around the wrong things. Mm-hmm. That's not particularly helpful. You know, similarly, if the researchers uh, are identifying the the needs and the activities yeah. and nobody's listening to them, that's not particularly helpful either. So it's, the, you know, there's an absolute reciprocity there. And, and we have to, as a sector, be much better because certainly I would suggest from a North American or certainly from a Canadian context, the days when science drove policy are long behind us. Mm-hmm. You know, th- there were times when science really drove policy. Today, it's much more about public opinion driving policy. Right. And the kinds of challenges that we face in, you know, threats to ecosystems, biodiversity loss, climate change, these are often caused by, you know, compound actions of ma- large numbers of people, small actions by millions of people. You know, that has to be part of the solution. You can't mandate compliance. And again, I'm not saying that policy isn't a part of the solution, yeah. but people have to do it. It's a bit more like organized resi- religion. Yeah. If m- large numbers of people have to do it because it's the right thing to do not because they're being told to Mm. by a law Mm. or an authority. Mm. Or they're receiving some benefit from it, you know. Yeah, they just have to. And and again, this is like, you know, if we could convince every human on the planet, um, you know, to think that reincarnation is real, maybe they'd take a bit better care of things. (laughs) You know, but, but in terms of indigenous ways of knowing, you know, it's the seven generation. If, if it was deep in your personal identity and culture that you, it's just intrinsic to consider the generations that come after you and your obligation to them, mm. you, you know, you live your life differently. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested in your perspective about trying to capture the evidence on the outcomes you know from various quite large kind of macro scale conservation mm-hmm. programs and cohorts across multiple years it reminds me of a conversation i had with uh, professor bill Sutherland at cambridge mm-hmm. uni who's uh, mm-hmm. leading conservation evidence mm-hmm. you know, which is all about in his own words and i love it it was like you know we need to do more of what's been proven to work and less of what's been not proven to work yet like focusing on the bright spots the area that, where we know it's the right you know, nails that are being driven, yeah. in, if you like using your metaphor, then we'll, well get more bang for our buck. But it's very hard to do, and it does take bravery, doesn't it, for organisations that have been doing things it in does a certain take way for years. And, you know, courage isn't rewarded in our society. Mm. So certainly a Canadian risk, context. Yeah. In a Canadian context, a tremendous portion of the sector is government. You know, so, of course, a lot of the employees, a lot of the big investments are government jobs. It's national parks, it's fisheries and oceans, it's Canadian Wildlife Service. And inherently, those government structures are risk adverse. Mm. You know, individuals, bright, aspirational people, often young leaders who take chances. If they, if they're unsuccessful, that's very career limiting. Mm. You know, because the part so courage is not rewarded, at least in the government sector generally. Yeah. And these are just gross generalizations. I accept that, but so that's what's in many cases, sucked all the life and innovation out of the sector. We've become a very cautious uh, group of human beings 
and we're a herding species so you know that it, it's hard to shift that culture yeah. um, that organizational norm and we just don't have time the next decade we have to get this right mm. you know so it, it does require quite a shift and you know brian and those guys i mean they're great they're, i mean that's that's great work that's innovative stuff that is a game changer i really believe um mm. for our sector yeah and so hats off to them i would just add to that that you know we also hold ourselves out looking for for perfection you know sometimes perfection is the enemy of progress mm -hmm. and it's like we don't have to have a hundred percent of the information we need to know enough to act yeah you know so there's a lot of there's a lot of ideas and progress out there where we, don't, we haven't absolutely got 100% of it. We definitely know it's good, you know, and I think we need to be, you know, confident to to run with those. And and we need to be okay. Like, we need to create an, a cultural environment for our next generation of conservation leaders that, it, you know, it's okay to fail. It's yeah. okay to make mistakes. Yeah. Um, and that we're just more supportive of each other. There's a mantra in business, which is like, you know, fail fast. You know, if you're going to do something, give it a go. If it fails, move on, keep going. And in many ways, the business sector is where the innovation is in, in most markets, actually. And, and I feel like we need more of that thinking within the conservation movement too. Well, be brave, yeah. try different things, do more. I, mean, I, guess I, I agree with you. I think there's definitely things we can learn from the corporate sector. But I would, I would also sort of say, and again, I mean, maybe I'm biased, you know, because you know, I live in a national park, I've worked for the national park system. So like this island mentality, mm -hmm. this idea of what we need to do is get all the humans out of nature and build big fences around it and then it'd be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a mindset. It was pretty prevalent here in the 70s and 80s. Um, I think that applies to other sectors and I think it's held us back. Mm. I think we need to be really good friends with the agricultural sector I think we need to be good friends and colleagues and have interchange with the health and wellness sector, mm. with, you know, the education sector, with, with the corporate sector. You know, we have the, the conservation community has a massive amount to offer those sectors and we have a lot to gain from working closely with them. Yep. So I think, you know, the image in my mind is much more of a Venn diagram yep. rather than these silos. Yeah. You know, and I think there's, I, I think there's tremendous benefit both sides. Do you think we, as a conservation movement, understand our benefit and what we can and how we can help these other sectors? I think sometimes we don't. I think we, we yeah, don't know think, how to engage. We value ourselves all the time. Yeah, we take things for granted. I think often we tend to be quite humble, um, and you know we tend to have a lot of sort of hardworking, humble individuals that. And you know that find themselves in these careers. So, yeah, I I, I think there's a massive opportunity there yep. uh, for sure. And even you know, I, I you know I look at some of the work the Field Studies Council's done in the UK, and you know some work that goes on in Australia. You know, there's an element around sort of sort of national identity, which I think is really fascinating. Yeah. You know, obviously. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I imagine you've been following the football match with England and Germany, and <laughs> isn't bet. it bizarre that you know? I mean, I think it's. I think there's a lot of positive, but it's like, you know, why do British people care so much? Why is it such a unifying force? It's just a football match. It's not even a final, but you know, but it does. It's it runs deep, you know, and so it's like okay. This idea of like how, how what are the things that run really deep in the identities of communities and nations, and that can be negative and it can lead to conflict, but let, it can also be tremendously positive, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, the idea that, um, like I think in Scotland, where they uh worked on the curriculum so that all elements of the curriculum could be taught outdoors, mm. that's pretty innovative. You know, and it's and it's tied to there's some component of what it means to be Scottish that you're mm. connected to the outdoors. 
you know, some of the stuff that happens in Australia, where just like the rest of the world, Australia is massively urbanized now. But Aussies self-identify by the outback and the bush and, mm-hmm. you know, even if they've never been there, mm-hmm. Canadians, Canadians identify with the iconic bits of the Rockies, mm-hmm. you know, across the country. You know, vast majority of them will never get to visit, but mm-hmm. it's a source of pride. There's some kind of uh, like spiritual compass. Yep. Um, and I think it's tremendously unifying. I mean, certainly in a country like Canada, you know, it's tremendously varied there's lots of cultural things that divide us you know but our connection to wildlife and nature and the you know is something that seems to run deep and be common in a similar way to you know football and british people you know so yeah so i think there's a whole fascinating sort of behavioral science dimension that we're not tapping into at all uh, in terms of our sort of collective identities. And I think it could be much more powerful um, uh, in terms of sort of advancing conservation ethic as a societal norm. Mm. Really fascinating. Now, before the call, I did a little bit of homework around you as well. I just want to kind of um, yeah. read a bit back, which I found really interesting. It very much connects to what we've been talking about today. So you describe yourself as a change agent building high functioning teams with real impact and always striving to work yourself out of the job. And you've already referenced that already. And I was really interested that you worked as vice president of education and youth at ocean wise mm-hmm. um, for four years. Um, and you grew the budget from two and a half million to 8.6 million over that time. Um, and program participants of your education programs from 200,000 to 500,000. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested. You're obviously innovative, big thinking, you like transformational change, Mm-hmm. setting up new systems and sort of stepping back once it reaches mm-hmm. i guess a tipping point i guess you feel maybe your work's been done at that point time to do the next challenge maybe but could you just talk through this process of change that you, you try to take the teams through i'm kind of interested in that so you started off as uh, ocean wise you know four years what what did you do day one hour one and what happened over those four years to see that change and you know how how, how does that how's that yeah occur? um I mean, I guess it is a little bit iterative. Uh, I I am a big systems guy. So, I mean, that is an example. So I've done that two or three times now. And now mostly what I do is work with organizations. You know, so I don't work with a single organization anymore. Now I try and work with any organization that's interested in pace and scale uh, in terms of conservation youth. So, I mean, the first thing is you've got to start where they're at. You know, so... Um, you know, you've got to spend a little bit of time wrapping your head around what is the sort of, what's the raison d'etre of the organization? What's the sort of some kind of asset map? What are the values? Um, and those kind of things, you know, and often in organizations, there's, you know, tremendous sort of credence and expertise that is taken for granted or not fully appreciated, you know, Mm -hmm. because people are too close to it. Um, I mean, I have a few sort of systems tools I've developed, but one of the things in particular at OceanWise is like very talented group of educators. Um, One of the things they were doing is they were working within a set budget, you know, so, and that's very common in particularly the kind of zoo and aquarium sector. And well, in fact, all civil, civic institutions, certainly in North America. So people tend to be given a budget and they build a program to match the budget. Yeah. And I think that's massively debilitating. Easy money, easy money's debilitating. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we didn't we didn't operate that way. You know, so if, if you don't have a budget, there's no limit on your growth. Um, so, uh, so anyways, we, so we start off and we sort of implement some sort of business systems and make sure that the management team, you know, so the management managers co-create the plan and all the managers and all the sectors are transparent about their, you know, income expenditure, key performance indicators, you know, on a, at least quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. Um, So really trying to create a cadence where the team self identifies as a team, Um, you know, so that might be sort of getting all the managers together, even if it's for a 15 minute standing meeting, you know, daily, 
every single day they they would be like surprised to find two or more of them are working on the same thing and oh we can you know, every day they found an efficiency or a or an optimism there which was good um so those kinds of things are helpful generally what i sort of bring in those in those situations is yeah a little bit of kind of discipline around the systems but often the sort of connecting it to the global thought leadership so when you've got you know for example educators working with four and five year olds on nature play activities mm -hmm. helping them understand here's how that ladders up to the sustainable development goals or the activities of the convention on biological diversity or the ocean literacy principles mm -hmm. you know or the program plan of the iucn why is that and, important then what difference does that make well i thought i found it to be tremendously empowering you know so Again, particularly in the conservation education sector, there's a there's a bit of a self-esteem issue. People don't fully value the contribution they're making because it's less immediate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and because the real results aren't seen for 20 years. Um, so first of all, in many cases, they're not very familiar with those big thought leadership structures and principles. Um, and by building it into their operational planning, they get much more familiar with the vocabulary, they get more confident in those kind of conversations, and they just, it, it just becomes much clearer to them their role in the success of those big aspirational endeavours. Right, so it's um, about connection to impact and really motivating people to be better yeah, and, in their and, work. Yeah, and you know, sharing and celebrating right. successes of individuals and teams. You know, so just you know, everyone in that organization, you know, is gonna contribute in a sort of unique and valuable way. Mm -hmm. You know, so and just embracing that. Um, so some of those things have been, yeah, pretty effective. You know, just little things like getting people, I mean, what what get me gets measured matters, you know? So yeah. having the cadence of like, okay, here's your target. You've defined your target. Maybe it's 5,000 kids in a particular program in a particular year. Maybe it's a monetary target, whatever. And then, you know, tracking that each quarter so that you sit around the table with your peers and you're like, okay, I see how we're doing. Yeah. You know, I mean, tragically in the charitable sector, especially, historically people would set a target in january and review it in december but it was kind of too late by then yeah. you know there just isn't that yeah. there's just not that culture that discipline and also looking at the qualitative and the quantitative so you know we would always you know co-create a plan set some sort of you know annual or quarterly targets but there would be quantitative targets like number of web hits or whatever program participants but there have to be qualitative ones as well so mm -hmm. on your journey that you you know coach and support those managers and directors to say okay you're trying to do this tell me what are the three qualitative indicators that you're on track for each quarter so for example you know if you've got a manager who's building out a nature play program or a summer camp program they're probably going to say, well, the month before, I better have all my staff recruited, you know, and the month before that, I better have collected the resources or designed the program or surveyed last year's participants or whatever. Yeah. And so just the mental exercise mm -hmm. of working through that mm -hmm. um, and doing it, you know, alongside and seeing what their other colleagues are doing, you know, some other colleague is designing an online learning program and they're, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unpacking that and, dis and dissecting it it's tremendously empowering yeah. you know and I would say and we would go through those you know uh, during our reviews and you know if and we would sort of identify them green or red okay it's a qualitative indicator that we're on track mm -hmm. if it's green if, if all of your indicators are green you're not pushing yourself hard enough right if they're all red you're kidding yourself you know it's like you've got to get the balance yeah. you know we're not looking for you know, we're not looking to see that whole spreadsheet green across all sectors because that just means everyone's coasting. Yeah, yeah, this is too easy. It's like a dashboard. 
And it, it links... Oh, it's all about, yeah, it's all about performance dashboard. And it links to something we were talking about earlier about failure as well. I mean, what if you had a individual or a, a team under your leadership, which is just consistently failing to hit targets or, you know, isn't hitting key things? What would be your response to that as the kind of the, the, the leader in charge? Yeah, I mean, I think... <laughs> I mean, I was a high school teacher for a long time. And for me, my sort of... My leadership style, I guess, you know, when you're teaching high school, your job is to keep trying different strategies until the kid gets it or you retire. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you just have to be creative and keep trying different things and exposing them to other sort of role models and coaches if you're not the bright fit for them. Um, I mean, I guess there are times I, I can't think of a time where we've sort of coached somebody out, you know, it's like the old idea of coach them up or coach them out. We haven't coached people out, um, but we have sometimes encouraged them to pursue other passions, uh-huh. you know, and say, you know, what, you find a different avenue for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think there's, you know, I think people perform to, the, to your expectations of them. And I tend to have ridiculously high expectations. Yeah my teams but uh, I, yeah i wonder if that was also part of your sort of change leadership too in terms of removing that budget threshold that maybe sort of limits the ability to grow and limits ambition is, is part of the role as the leader about the visioning as well the bigger picture the ambition of the program could be way bigger than we're currently thinking yeah and how do you, you know, create that and you know and get... self-identifying as it's not about an organization winning it's about being part of a social movement Right. You know, that's that's a much bigger piece. Exposing people to communities of practice is really important. You know, so we would generally. So, for example, you know, there's a community of practice for youth serving agencies, Scouts, Guide Cadets, people like that. That's an interesting community practice that Mm -hmm. you want to have some of your middle management folks exposed to and and so on. There's community of practice for experiential education, you know, the outward bound, the knolls. Uh, a lot of the sub account folks, they're great people, very professional. You can learn a lot from them. There's communities practice, obviously, within formal education. Um, so trying to, within your team, have each leader, each manager or director is your organization's go-to. They're the face of your organization in that community of practice. And, you know, you want to infiltrate as many as possible. And embrace and celebrate the fact that, you know, they're going to those conference and events, they're pres- they're presenting, they're your expert, and you can celebrate them, mm-hmm. and they've got their specialism, if you like. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. I think that's, those kind of things are really helpful. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'm just conscious of our time. And I want to kind of start moving towards the end of the podcast, where we talk really about careers advice, you know, a lot of people mm-hmm. come to us, because they want to start their careers in wildlife conservation or, or similar. They might be students at university or even graduates, job seekers right now. We also get people like mid-career professionals looking to switch and transfer themselves into the sector. You know, they see opportunity mm-hmm. and they want to kind of make their impact there. Um, have you got any sort of, you know, careers advice for people who are looking to kind of get going in this sector, um, whether it be in Canada or more, more generally? Yeah, I mean... I mean, I think my career pathway is a sort of long and winding road, you know, so I didn't, it's interesting. So as a teenager, I really wanted to be an outdoor guide. I really wanted to work for Outward Bound. Um, And I did that um, Mm -hmm. in Wales for a little bit. Um, So it's interesting for me, I had this desire to work, not necessarily in nature conservation, but in an outdoor uh, environmental type drop job and then sort of deviated from that and went into teaching and I was teaching design technology mm. um, and then used my teaching credentials to allow me to sort of travel and live and work in the outdoors so my kind of work supported my uh, lifestyle, if you like, and I, you know, taught in New Zealand and obviously taught in Canada and moved around a lot and did a lot, you know, and then, you know, the opportunity came up, um, with the outdoor school for parts Canada and Jasper, 
you know, to put together that business case and train the team and get them, those guys rolling. Um, and that was when my sort of work life and home life flipped. You know, so then my hobby became my work, you know, and uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so that's, where, you know, so I, I would honestly say that I sort of fell into it because I had certain sort of skills and attributes. You know, I did a education leadership MBA um, while Ken Robinson was at Warwick. And anyways, um, so I was fortunate. Um, so I guess I'd say. I mean, there, there just aren't really clear career pathways unless you want to be a biologist and go through the traditional university type route. And that is a good route for lots of people. Um, but I think it's about sort of trying to be, you know, an autodidact and a polymath. You know, you want to know and understand how you learn best. Do you learn best by reading books? Do you learn best by you know, mentorship from a role model, you know, just, but really dig into how do I learn best and, and experience that and be quite sort of, uh, sort of proactive about that, mm -hmm. understand your own learning. And, and the polymath piece about, you know, try to be good at whatever you choose to be good at, you know, and I really think like the skills of learning how you learn uh, are, can be really powerful. Um, you know, in many ways, I think working in a, a nearby sector is actually or can be a real fast track. Yeah. You know, so if somebody said, you know what, in 15, 20 years, I want to be the CEO of WWF or Conservation International. Mm -hmm. You know, you could take the policy track. You could. There's lots of paths you could take. But if you went and spent five years working in the health and wellness sector, and built relationships and got to understand how it ticks and then jumped ship and went and worked in the ecotourism sector or mm -hmm. the education sector or and then went and worked uh, at some level in the natural resource sector or the agriculture sector, mm -hmm. you start to become a tremendously interesting value proposition, mm -hmm. you know, because your ability to walk into different worlds, you know, and, it kind of code switch like all of these communities you know we're all quite tribal as humans so if you understand the vocabulary and the man mannerism and you can be comfortable sitting down with you know natural resource sector folks and you know ecotourism folks and government folks you start to make yourself a tremendously valuable asset um mm -hmm. So I, you know, I certainly encourage people to have a diverse range of experiences. I would say that living and working in different countries has been a tremendous sort of advantage for me. And I know it's not for everybody, um, but it, it is amazing. You know, just, I mean, a lot of the countries I've lived in are all culturally relatively similar, you know, um, but, you know, I, you, I don't think you can underestimate the value of living in a different culture. Yeah. Um, and I actually think that it's maybe it's the COVID uh, world, but it seems to be less common. It seems as the internet rises, young people traveling to meet other young people and have shared experience in different cultures is declining. Mm. Uh, so I think you can live more vicariously now. You know, do you really need to? you know, go backpacking around Australia or if you can Google map Bondi Beach. Yeah. Um, Watch a vlog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, you know, I do encourage people to, you know, stretch their comfort zones and try to have shared experiences in different cultures, even if it's different cultures within the same country. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great advice, yeah. And as a kind of wrap-up question, we like to ask kind of, you know, quite big open questions towards the end of our discussions. And I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Like if I could make you um, a global czar for the day, you know, you can be a, and, and you know, you're, you're a sole ruler of this planet of ours and you have the ability to make one change or enact one law, whatever it might be, to try and improve the biodiversity conservation status of this planet. What, 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 might, what rule might you enact? That's interesting. Um, 
Well, one thing I might do is amend the Charter of, Charter of Rights and uh, Freedoms for Canada to include a connection to nature. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think all countries should have that, but certainly a country like Canada, it should be intrinsic to what it is to be Canadian. It should be your right to have that connection to nature, um, just like it's your right to free speech yep. or free expression. So maybe I'd do that globally if I really was that powerful. <laughs> um, one of the other things I think is, you know, interesting uh, and something that I think would make a really big difference if, you, you know, so my, a lot of my, my sort of big thought leaders, you know, people that I take a lot of inspiration from. So, you know, guys like John Dewey and John Dewey's, you know, he's, so he's a great exponential ed guy. So his great fear was that young people would understand natural processes. They would understand nature, but they wouldn't experience joy in nature be purely mm -hmm. academic, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And although Leopold, you know, another giant, um, although Leopold's great fear was that young people would enjoy and consume nature without understanding nature. Hmm. And so I think we've got to find a way to do both. You know, it can't be, you know, saving ecosystems, advancing biodiversity, you know, it can't be a chore. It can't be something that we do because it's good for us, mm. but we don't like it. Mm. You know, we have to, as a species, embrace and enjoy and be really get a deep sense of, you know, pride and satisfaction from our stewardship of nature. Yeah. Um, and so there's, you know, it's two sides of the same coin, but we've got to, we've just got to get a lot better at, keeping the joy and you know mitigating some of the fear which is getting harder and harder by the year mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but we can't be paralyzed by fear we have to find the joy in nature and the harmony and understand and, and get yeah and understand that the sort of our duty to other species as well as ourselves yeah yeah fantastic it reminds me of, I think it was Attenborough said something on the lines of people won't conserve what they don't um, understand or, or love, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so building that in. And, and There was a great video, uh, it's years ago now, called Love Not Loss, that the IUCN put out. You could mm -hmm. probably find, mm -hmm. still find it on YouTube. And, yep. you know, and it certainly resonates with me. Yep. Um, yep. You know, it's, we have to... And, and, and especially when we're working with children, you know, it's not fair to pass on, you know, to screw things up and just go, good luck with that. You know, we shouldn't traumatize the young. We've yeah. got to give at least give them a chance to fall in love with nature before we ask them to save it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There was also a great uh, study and publication done called Branding for Biodiversity by an agency. Oh, yeah, yeah. Terra. Yeah, that's state, and they talked about that also about they talked about kill the extinction message i think was quite nice like stop talking so much about that because people tend to withdraw and bury their heads in the sand and feel threatened you know talk well, you about know, it's love interesting, link it's it interesting to you mentioned that i realize we've got to close off but okay. it's so fascinating in these human systems how there are these sort of seminal moments mm -hmm. or texts or things that mm -hmm. for some reason just resonate yep. and I mean, I don't think it's particularly mainstream, but I agree with you the the Futura work was really well done mm -hmm. and certainly guided a lot of my work, you know, a decade or so ago, whenever that was. Yep. You know, and I do feel, you know, there's certain key events. So, you know, there's certain, there's a, you know, of all the gatherings and events and stuff you go to, there's, you know, a handful, two or three that stand out in my career. I'm like, man, just being at that place in that time informed and you know that that was really critical to the you know my success and um, so obviously you only know those in hindsight but i do think it's interesting you know and i'll just you know go back you know to the comment about the you know the big rio de declaration which was excellent in many ways and the only you know but the what there is a there's thought leadership that came out of that that did hold us back and it's a bit like the don't be don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed by fear you know 
don't be deluded to thinking there's a single solution. Yeah. You know, these are complex challenges. They're going to require sophisticated, multidisciplinary solutions. And some of those solutions and interventions are going to be fast track, pragmatic policy change and, and things like that. And other of them are going to be really long track, slow burn. You know, I often sort of say to folks, you know, the reason our community needs to be investing in the generations that come after us is exactly that. Like education is our retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Education's why there'll be a conservation community in 50 and 100 years time. Mm -hmm. you know? When we've done ourselves out of the job. Yeah. Yeah. When we've all done ourselves out of a job and smarter, harder working people than us, are, <laughs> you know, outperforming us tenfold. Yeah, that reminds me also of uh, another interview we had where someone said, never be the smartest person in the room. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I rarely am. So that's that's fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, in your comment, you know, when, you know, just reflecting on the question about how do you, you know, how do you create high functioning teams? It's, you know, hire smart people yeah, and get yeah, out of the way. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, your job is get them the resources, get, you know, clear the bureaucratic hurdles you know, that's your job. Give yeah. them room to run. Yeah, yeah. Let them fly. Yeah. Great. Well, James, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you again. Uh, thank you so much for finding the time to kind of jump on the podcast and share your thoughts and also the plans for the future and what you're working on right now. Uh, good luck with your Centre of Conservation Excellence. Um, I'm very hopeful. It sounds like a fantastic direction you're taking. If people want to find out a bit more about you and your mm -hmm. work and what's going on, where should we send them or which places should we send them to? Uh, you can find me through the Canadian Committee for IUCN. Yep. I'm the, currently the President of Canada. Um, yeah, certainly. Ha yeah, you, I'm, I'm not very difficult to track down. I don't actually have a, I don't have a website uh, for my consulting business at all, uh, mostly because I'm busier. Than, don't need <laughs> than it, right? And I want to be away with it. I'm a pretty easy guy to track down. That's great. Okay, right. Well, we'll we'll find a link and then you send it there. Um, send people there, you know, in the footnotes. Yeah. Once again, thank you so much for your time and thanks for jumping on the show. Well, and thanks for everything you guys do. You know, it's not a it's not an easy task, uh, but it's an aspirational task, and uh, I think it is making a difference. So, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, and also, please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation hyphen careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.